Sure. Good morning. Today's date is uh, July 8th, 2012. The scripture reading is uh, as advertised in the quarterly, which is 2 Samuel uh, 23, verses 1 through 7, and 1 Chronicle 18, verse 14. <clears throat> and I think we should offer a prayer for Aaron if he can survive without them here. Don't you think? He'll be fine. Yeah, he will? Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> I think some people are still coming in. Um, today's setting is, um, this is after the, just after the second war with the Philistines and Israel was led by David through this war and uh, of course with God's help they were uh, successful and this is often, uh, this is part of the, the song of deliverance uh, that David is offering up. So if you'll turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1. Now these are the last words of David. The oracle of David, the son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is upon my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, When one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth upon a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. Yea, does not my house stand so with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. For will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? But godless men are all like thorns that are thrown away. For they cannot be taken with the hand. But the man who touches them arms himself with iron and the shaft of a spear, and they are utterly consumed with fire. Second Chronicles 18, verse 14. So David reigned over all Israel, and he administered justice and equity to all his people. The word of the Lord. No, but he said, if I talk loud, it'll be all right. Uh, does he usually open with a prayer? I can't remember. No, he just starts talking. It's kind of, uh, it's just not that clear, guys. If you need a, there's some handwritten copies if you want to get one. Okay. Um, a few, first of all, my name is Mike Foster, if you don't know me. My claim to fame is being my father's son. And... I'm thrilled to be that, uh, but I'm privileged because I actually have uh, involvement in a lot of different areas of the church right now. I've been spending most of the year with the elementary school kids, and for the last two months I've been teaching the uh, Almond class, which is our eldest class. They t range any well, I think roughly they're mid 80s to mid 90s that class has been around since before World War II and uh, my son along with Alex's daughter and Matt's uh, Aaron's daughter are going up to uh, youth or I guess they're ahead of John right yeah, one year ahead of John, because John had to repeat kindergarten, which he's still mad about. <laughs> and so John will be going through confirmation, and I'll be getting back involved in that. So it's a privilege to be involved with all these different ages of our church. But it also clearly states that we need more teachers, and we need more sponsors. 
youth is okay because parents at that level are, you see this kind of interesting desperation as they see their kids become so independent that they try for the last few years to kind of hang on and still nurture those kids. So typically the youth have plenty of sponsors and teachers. Not so in elementary uh, and not so in adult. Some of our elementary dads like myself have our kids are growing up, we need to move on a little bit, we need some younger dads to step up. And some of our teachers for adults are wanting to scale back a little bit, they've been doing it for years. The same three or four or five men, and uh, Julia Boyce is teaching this month, we would love to have more women teachers. But in any case, uh, I told uh, Bonnie and Miata that I would start trying to put that word out that not everybody wants to get up in front of people and speak, but I promise you that anybody can do it, okay? I promise you that, and you'll be enriched by it. So if anybody listening or watching who's not here today, if you have any interest, uh, just talk about it with one of the uh, education folks and uh, give it a shot. And uh, I've never been thrown out of a classroom before at church, <laughs> ever. Okay, um, I teach a little bit differently than my dad. I, I tend to just do kind of a flow and I don't typically do points one, two, three, or A, B, C. So I almost didn't do any overhead at all, but I was worried that uh, that would ruffle feathers, so I decided to go ahead and do it. <laughs> Better safe than sorry, right? So I have five points, and they look like they're real long, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. Uh, I told Philip I want to make this sweet, if possible, and I want to make it short so you can get up and get some circulation, especially if you're going to stay for late service, which I have a feeling will run late. Yesterday, as I sat down to do my lesson, a little bit later than I normally do, but I had other things I had to attend to. I sat down ready to read the scripture and I didn't realize that I was sitting on these glasses. <laughs> and I broke them, I broke a lens out, and I don't have a replacement and I can't read without my glasses. So I had to go scrambling up and I found an optometrist who was trying to close up for the day. He's about 80 years old and he immediately starts giving me a lecture that he ought to sell me the frames, but he won't because I need an eye exam and new glasses. And I said, well, how do you know that? He goes, boy, no, he said, son, I've been in this business a long time. I said, he goes, you need an exam. I said, okay, okay. I just need to get up and going, though. And so he actually tightened everything up, put it together, and no charge, sent me on my way. Sweetheart of a guy. I didn't know what I was going to do. Okay. Some of you read John, and we're not studying John. We went back to the lectionary. And actually, I'm not even going to really comment on the verses that Buddy read, but I appreciate you reading them. <laughs> That's your job. But I'm, I'm only going uh, to make a comment or two on it. But I wanted him to read it because I want to make a point. Part of what I'm going to talk about is the, uh, is the Old Testament and its relevance to us today. I had a conversation with two people this week, uh, not really a conversation, but more of an exchange. And it was kind of interesting. It had to do with the fact that we've been in the Old Testament for, well, a couple of months now, I guess, in the Old Testament. And the first person complained about that. And then the second person said, well, we probably don't even need to teach out of the Old Testament anymore, period. And that, you know, it wasn't a well thought out statement. It was more of a reactionary statement. But I thought about it because, you know, my favorite book of the Bible is Ecclesiastes. And 
my favorite psalm is Psalm 8, and I go back to those all the time. The very first lesson I ever taught, which really taught me that I could be a teacher, was the Genesis story of the fall of Adam and Eve. And so I started thinking about that. I thought, well, do people really see the Old Testament as obsolete? Obsolete in the sense that it's just history and it doesn't have relevance in light of the good news of the gospel. Is it, is it no longer teachable to sophisticated modern Christians as compared to teaching the gospel? And should we be done with it? And then I started thinking, well, you know, I always have an issue with our lectionary. We, we support the Presbytery that publishes it, you know. And I don't want to throw them under the bus because they have enough problems of their own, you know, of course. But I think, the, I think what the two folks that I was talking to were objecting to was the way the Old Testament is presented to us. And most teachers are, and preachers are pretty loyal to, you know, what we're asked to teach. My dad has been doing it so long that he, he has the leeway to do whatever he wants. And, you know, I mean, I do too, really. Anybody does. But we try to, we try to follow the lectionary. And, uh, but in this case, for instance, what Buddy read today, it's, it's, uh, it's a variant on, on Psalm 18, okay? It's categorized in, Saint, in 2 Samuel in, at least in my Jerusalem Bible, as supplementary information. That means that it's an addition by a later editor. And it is not attributed to David at all. Okay? And that's what was chosen for us to teach. And so when I read this militaristic victory account, which is generic to any victorious general, I thought, well, if I were you, I would not want to hear me drivel on about this. I mean, it has some, it has some nice phrases in it and so forth, some nice thoughts, but that's where the difficulty lies. So then I asked myself in reading through 2 Samuel, why wouldn't I start at the beginning of the story like the author intended? Why wouldn't I start with this? And this, this poem has been authenticated. It is directly ascribed to David, unlike the other. This one, by the two or three scholars that I consulted, this, there's no question that this is considered to be a personal poem of King David. And I have the verses written down here. This is 2 Samuel 1, 17. David's elegy over Saul and Jonathan. Then David made this lament over Saul and his son Jonathan. It's written in the book of the just so that it may be taught to the sons of Judah. Alas, the glory of Israel has been slain on your heights. How did the heroes fall? Do not speak of it in Gath, where the Philistine giants were from nor announce it in the streets of Ashkelon, or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice, the daughters of the uncircumcised will gloat. O mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain on you. I didn't realize this was that, this long, I'm gonna shorten it. O daughters of Israel, weep for Saul. How did the heroes fall in the thick of battle? O oh, Jonathan, in your death I am stricken. I am desolate for you, Jonathan, my brother. Very dear to me you were. Your love to me more wonderful than the love of a woman. Saul and Jonathan, loved and lovely, neither in life nor in death were divided. How did the heroes fall and the battle armor fail? Now you see the difference there? Can you tell that there's personal feeling here? And he's asking, he's mourning, and he's saying, how could this happen? How could Saul and my great friend Jonathan lose the spiritual war? So the Old Testament 
it depends. If you don't like something you're reading, flip a few pages and you'll find something that you will like, or that will speak to you, I should say. Now, there's another, and this came up a few weeks ago when we were talking about the Hebrews putting entire villages to the sword, men, women, children, and animals. And uh, when you're talking about the Old Testament, a lot of people have a real dilemma because the Israelites believe that they are acting under the guidance of Yahweh, their God. They attribute every victory to him, and they're giving no quarter to the tribes around them. They're slaughtering them. How on earth can we reconcile the behavior with God's revelation? And, you know, violence in the name of religion, of course, is nothing new. We, uh, this was about 3,000 years ago, but you know, just 400 years ago, uh, the colonists, the Puritans, Presbyterians, Catholics, Congregationalists, Lutherans, all supported the extermination of entire villages of Native Americans. And it not only was condoned by the clergymen, it was encouraged because this was the taking over of land that was going to be put to the purpose of God, and the Native Americans did not know God, and therefore they were not living godly lives, and they had no right to the land. Okay? That's the view of the colonists. The only people who objected to that were the Quakers. And for a while in Pennsylvania, William Penn was able to protect the Indians and actually have a friendly trade, but that fell apart under pressure as more people moved in. So we, and this has gone on in the Congo and Africa, the church in Nazi Germany supported the, a lot of the atrocities, if, if not more than tacitly. So it's an ongoing problem, uh, people doing bad things in the name of God. Now, no mature Christian no mature Christian can believe that God orchestrated or reveled or continues to do so in man's ruthless savagery. It is entirely... I can't remember how I did these things. Here it is. Okay, it is entirely incompatible because you recall that God's first covenant was that he would never as creator, be the cause of the demise of his creation. Very first covenant. It wasn't just that he wasn't going to flood again. It was that he was not going to destroy his creation. So to say that God wants people destroyed is incompatible with what his agreement is with us. And human behavior that is grossly incompatible with God's revelation as a result of either misinterpretation or the manipulation, manipulation of God's revelation is a result of human sin. It's the result of God saying, this is what I want for you. You have to figure out on your own how you're going to get it because I'm not controlling you as a puppet. You have the free will to act as you see fit. God's revelation to man, what his nature is, what our nature is, and how the two relate, is found all through the Bible. And the Bible, the Old Testament, should be read again and again by every mature Christian. It is the bedrock of, it is the bedrock of revelation on which the church is built. And Jesus said that himself that he did not come to do away with the Old Testament. He came to fulfill it, so it should stand. As Christians, and I put this in quotations 
because I, I don't know if I made this term up or not. We do not profess, we do not profess or live out conversion theology. Conversion theology is the idea that the acceptance of Jesus Christ as our Savior is the end all of becoming a Christian. And getting others to do so at their peril of damnation is how we spend our time. There may be another term for that. I call it conversion theology. Because when you're an immature Christian and you run into trouble in life, you feel like you have to reconvert. People do it all the time. I'm doing something wrong, I've been bad, I better reconvert. I better be born again. I sinned, I gotta be born again. That's a sign of an immature Christian. We don't believe in that. We also don't believe in trying to force others to believe what we believe. We are open Hang on. I skipped a little part of the Old Testament, but I'll go back to it. We are open to offering to share our faith with others and with our children, but we don't mandate it. The let me just finish the part. I'm sorry. I think I'm having heat stroke up here. I'm skipping around a little bit. The, uh, to finish up on the Old Testament and the, and the ambiguities and the things that we're uncomfortable with, the violence, the sexuality, uh, the dis, you know, everything that's in there. Um, being uncomfortable with parts of the Old Testament because, because of its content or because we don't feel its relevance is just part of being a Christian who has free will and is not obligated to believe every passage of the Bible, which was written down by people like ourselves. Okay? We're not bound to think that every word in the Bible is correct. We know it's not. We know that it was heavily edited. We know that many stories about David, for instance, they placed him in Goth in three different capacities. One, he's destroying their army. Two, he's working for them. And three, he's hiding over there. Okay? So people look at that and they say, well, there's no, there's no David. These are just stories. They don't make sense. They're contradictory. Well, it's because oral traditions came together by the students who were gathering it and they felt like they needed to put everything in. And then editors later went in and then tried to take stuff out. So that's what has come down to us. Plus, we, we are reading from you know, the Greek translation into English and several more translations down the road we're into. So the, the point is that God is not fully explained in the Bible. Not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. He's not fully explained. His providence, providence meaning that he sustains and guides human destiny, remains his privilege as to how he was doing that. That's God's privilege. We don't understand it. It remains in his dominion along with everything else that's unexplained. As a mature Christian, you have to be ready to say that you don't know when somebody asks you a question or if somebody challenges you, challenges you. You know, immature Christians who are on college campuses, and listen, I'm not trying to be too critical of them because I love all Christians because they're doing God's work. I love seeing young Baptists carrying their Bibles. I think it's great. But I think some of their efforts are misguided in the sense that people 
react wrongly to them and thus to Christianity. But when young life folks or other people are on college campuses, they're drilled with a bunch of questions and then they're drilled with a bunch of pat answers for any time that they're challenged. Well, you know, you, if you're in business, you're prepared for people to ask you questions, you need to have answers. But sometimes the answer is, I don't know. And I've been spending a lot of my life trying to figure it out. And I'm going to keep on trying to figure that out. Okay? That's the sign of a mature Christian. Now, we do not mandate our religion, unlike some other religions and cults that are in the news. A few years ago, my son John, who's now 13, going into seventh grade, he'll be going through confirmation at this church in January. A few years ago, he asked me the question that I knew was coming. He said, Dad, why do we have to go to church? And I said, because, son, that's how we live. We are Christians, and on Sunday mornings, we go to church. Now, when you come of age, you can decide if you want to continue to come to church or not. I hope he does, and I think he will. But we tell our kids in confirmation all the time. We say, look, we're teaching you th these things so you can tell us, do you want to join the church or not? It's not a matter of we're going to disown you or hold it against you. If you don't, you're free to go. We want you here. We need you here. But you are free to go. And that's the beautiful thing about, one of the beautiful things about being Christians is we are free to come or go. God wants us to stay. He understands if we go away for a while and we come back. That happens quite a few times. But we're free to go. OK. And I want to, last thing I want to finish with is as, I, as I've been involved with so many different ages of the group, it's really interesting. I, I just have developed over the years the concept of what I call the mature Christian. And it has nothing to do with uh, age or station in life whatsoever. I mean, Aaron Flores Sr. was a quiet man who just happened to spend more hours volunteering in this city than any other man or woman for, I think, I don't know, at least one year, but I think maybe even more than that. Okay. Um, he's, he was a mature Christian, living his life to the end. We have, we have people, two of whom I know for sure, who were born into this church, fought in World War II, came back, married, buried a couple of wives, and are still here today, every Sunday morning upstairs in the almond class. Been coming here for over 70 years. That makes sense. I didn't add up the math. But they lived their whole lives. And, and so mature Christians understand, I think, uh, this, at least this is the way that I look at it, is that, that becoming a Christian is an easy thing to do. You may have hurdles, for instance, if your family doesn't believe, or they're Jewish, or you know, they're Muslim, or they don't believe anything at all, whatever. But the entry barriers to becoming a Christian are virtually none. You basically state the sinner's prayer. You say, God, I recognize you. I recognize that I'm a sinner. I want to not be a sinner. And I recognize that only you can help me. Tell me how. You're a Christian. Okay? Billy Graham got thousands of people to do that. Okay. Problem was, 
that he left town and those people had to go back to their families and their villages and their towns and their cities and they didn't know what to do. Okay, that's conversion theology. Okay, conversion is just the beginning. Being a mature, mature Christian means that we spend our lives striving through action to better the lives of those around us, whatever our sphere of influence is. Okay? That's how we bring the kingdom of God closer. It's not by pointing at people and saying, are you a Christian? Well, you better be. It's by saying, it's by saying what can I do to be nice to you today? What can I do to help you today? What can I do to make this world a little bit better today? to give a little bit more to this world than I just took today. That's, what, that's the way a mature Christian looks at life. Demonstrating love and kindness and patience in every phrase of life. Knowing that probably everything or most of what you do will go unnoticed and unheralded by the greater world. The only Christians these days that get any attention at all are the ones who are making incredibly hateful and harmful and anti-Christian statements, whether it's on the internet or a tweet or in the newspaper or in their church or on YouTube, okay, they're getting attention. Mature Christians should not expect to get a lot of attention, and that's just the way life is. Aaron Flores never asked for any attention. A mature Christian understands that, Christ, that, that Christianity, is, Christianity is about one thing, and I'll finish with this. The question as to how do we know God, we answer by saying we experience him over a lifetime. Over a lifetime. And how do we enjoy God, the first catechism? How do we enjoy God, which is the purpose of Christianity? If anybody ever asks you why you're a Christian and you say, well, because I know I need to follow the Ten Commandments or I need to not sin, well, that's not the best answer. It's a good answer. I mean, it's true. We need to follow the Ten Commandments. That's the basis for a happy life. And we need to, do, we need to try not to sin because sin causes pain in others as well as ourselves. And it separates us from our understanding of God. But the main point that God wants us to understand over a course of a lifetime is that he wants us to enjoy that life through seeking to understand him. That's the point of why we're here Sunday after Sunday. That's why people are here when they're kids, when they're youth, when they're young adults, when they're young families, when they're empty nesters, when they're retired uh, helpers, volunteers when they're in their 70s, 80s, 90s, until we die, okay? That's the mission of Christianity. And I'll close. I was going to read Deuteronomy, but we're out of time. Dear Father, thank you for being with us. Thank you for the memory of the service of Aaron Flores, Sr., May he rest in peace. Please be with our youth at Mo Ranch throughout the week. Keep them safe in the midst of the heat. Please be with us throughout the week and our loved ones who are not currently with us. And all we do and say, we do in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I didn't finish too early, but I got you out of here five minutes early. <laughs>